Today, FDA approvals in non-Hodgkin lymphoma, breast cancer, graft-versus-host disease, and mesothelioma, and a breakthrough therapy designation in cervical cancer. Welcome to OncLive News Network, I'm Christy Rosa. The FDA has approved the R-squared regimen of lenalidomide plus rituximab for use in patients with previously treated follicular lymphoma and marginal zone lymphoma. The approval was primarily based on findings from the Phase three AUGMENT trial in which the R-squared regimen reduced the risk of disease progression or death by 54% versus rituximab alone in patients with relapsed refractory indolent non-Hodgkin lymphoma. The median progression-free survival per independent review was 39.4 months with R-squared versus 14.1 months with rituximab alone at a median follow-up of 28.3 months. By investigator assessment, the median PFS was 25.3 months versus 14.3 months respectively, and the overall response rate was also significantly improved with the combination. The ORR per independent review was 78% with R-squared compared with 53% with single agent rituximab. The 78% ORR with R-squared included a 44% complete response rate and a 34% partial response rate. Additionally, overall survival data across the entire population show that the hazard ratio for OS was 0.61 at a median follow-up of 28.3 months. The two-year OS rate was 93% for R-squared and 87% for rituximab alone. In breast cancer, the FDA approved the PI3 kinase inhibitor, Alpalesib, known by the trade name PICRAE, for use in combination with fulvostrant as a treatment for postmenopausal men and women with hormone receptor positive HER2 negative PIK3CA mutated advanced or metastatic disease following progression on or after an endocrine based regimen. This is the first PI3 kinase inhibitor approved by the agency for breast cancer. The decision was based on data from the Phase 3 Solar 1 trial. Among a subset of patients in the trial with PIK3CA mutations, the median progression-free survival by local assessment was 11 months for those on the epilessive arm, compared with 5.7 months for patients who received placebo plus fulvostrant. These data, which were assessed after a median follow-up of 20 months, translated into a 35% reduction in the risk of progression or death, with a hazard ratio of 0.65 in favor of alpalesib. There was no advantage to alpalesib on median PFS in patients without a PIK3CA mutation. Moreover, the overall response rate in the PIK3CA mutant cohort was 26.6% in the alpalesib fulvostrant arm versus 12.8% in the placebo fulvostrant arm. In the PIK3CA mutant subgroup with measurable disease, the ORRs were 35.7% and 16.2% respectively. The Therascreen PIK3CA RGQ PCR kit was simultaneously approved as a companion diagnostic test to detect the PIK3CA mutation in a tissue and or a liquid biopsy. The FDA has approved ruxolitinib for the treatment of adult and pediatric patients 12 years of age and older with steroid refractory acute graft versus host disease. The approval is based on findings from the phase two REACH-1 trial, which demonstrated that the combination of ruxolitinib with corticosteroids elicited a 57% overall response rate at day 28 in patients with steroid refractory acute graft versus host disease with a complete response rate of 31%. In February 2019, the FDA added three months to the review period for a supplemental new drug application for this indication of the JAK-1-2 inhibitor, making the new action date May 24, 2019. The extension period was to allow the agency to review additional data they had requested from Insight, the developer of ruxolitinib. Ruxolitinib was previously approved by the FDA as a treatment for patients with polycythemia vera who are intoler intolerant of or have an inadequate response to hydroxyurea, as well as for the treatment of patients with intermediate or high-risk myelofibrosis. In mesothelioma, the FDA has approved the Novo TTF 100L system in combination with pemetrexid and platinum-based chemotherapy for the frontline treatment of patients with unresectable, locally advanced, or metastatic malignant pleural disease, marking the first treatment for this patient population in more than 15 years. The decision is based on findings from the prospective single-arm stellar trial 
results of which showed that the median overall survival in patients with unresectable locally advanced or metastatic MPM who received TTF plus chemotherapy was 18.2 months. Specifically, data showed that the median OS was 21.2 months for patients with epithelioid MPM and 12.1 months for those with non-epithelioid MPM. 62% of patients enrolled who used Novo TTF 100L plus chemotherapy were still alive at one year, and the disease control rate in patients with at least one follow-up CT scan performed was 97%. The partial response rate was 40%, the stable disease rate was 57%, and the progressive disease rate was 3%. There was no increase in serious systemic adverse events with the combination of Novo TTF 100L and chemotherapy, and the most common device-related adverse event was mild to moderate skin irritation. The FDA has granted a breakthrough therapy designation to the tum tumor infiltrating lymphocyte therapy, LN145, for the treatment of patients with recurrent, metastatic, or persistent cervical cancer whose disease has progressed on or after chemotherapy. The designation is based on results from the ongoing Phase II Innovatil-04 trial, updated results of which will be presented at the 2019 ASCO annual meeting. Data in an abstract released ahead of the conference showed that the TIL therapy had an overall response rate of 44% in patients with advanced cervical cancer. The ongoing open-label multicenter phase trial accrued patients with advanced cervical cancer who received at least one line of chemotherapy. Of the 27 evaluable patients, additional data showed that the ORR included one complete response, nine partial responses, and two unconfirmed partial responses. The disease control rate was 89%, and at a median follow-up of 3.5 months, 11 of the 12 responding patients maintained their response. The manufacturing of LN145 comprises a 22-day process in which tills are generated at GMP facilities from tumors that have been shipped from local sites where they were initially harvested. The final LN145 till treatment is cryopreserved and shipped back from the GMP to the original site where the patient is being treated. This week, we sat down with Dr. John G. Gosney of Royal Liverpool and Broad Green University Hospital NHS Trust to discuss ensuring reliable results from molecular testing. The use of cytology specimens uh, in Europe is widespread. And uh, I think it's important to realize, first of all, about the difference between what we tend to consider histology and cytology and whether it's in fact more imagined than real. When you think about it, a histology specimen is a piece of tissue with a structure so that in the case of a, a non-small cell lung cancer, for example, you have the cells of the tumor arranged in three dimensions in a stroma. They are in context. A cytology specimen essentially consists of those cells pulled out of their context and dispersed. That's the essential difference. But I don't think that is a fundamental difference. And providing what you're looking for is integral to those individual cells, it really shouldn't matter whether they are in their context, in a stroma, or whether they dispersed. And indeed, cytology specimens have been widely used for the last decade to look for single driver gen genomic abnormalities, EGF1 mutations, IL cross 1 gene remains, with no trouble at all. And especially with a good aspirate, the failure rate, because of inadequate numbers of cells or inadequate DNA, is no greater than that for histology specimens. There has been a rather a reluctance to use cytology specimens for pdl one expression, and this has arisen from the fact that cytology was not used in the clinical trials of the immune modulators that have now come to market, nor was it used by the diagnostics companies in developing their immunochemical assays. And that's led to a, an understandable reluctance to um, promote cytology as a medium. However, if you look at the literature, you will see that there is no good evidence from any study, and there are now 10, maybe 15 over the last two years alone, to show that cytology is in any way inferior to histology as a medium for looking for pdl one expression. There are worries about fixation. There is evidence now to show that whether you fix in alcohol or formalin really doesn't matter. And I think the only problem in, in, 
in reality is that they are tricky to interpret. You need a good pathologist with a lot of experience to assess PDL1 expression in a cytology specimen. Uh, but notwithstanding that, cytology is an excellent substrate for anything that you might want to do with it when you're profiling on small cell lung cancer. The use of cytology specimens uh, in Europe is widespread. And uh, I think it's important to realize, first of all, about the difference between what we tend to consider histology and cytology and whether it's in fact more imagined than real. When you think about it, a histology specimen is a piece of tissue with a structure so that in the case of a, a non-small cell lung cancer, for example, you have the cells of the tumor arranged in three dimensions in a stroma. They are in context. A cytology specimen essentially consists of those cells pulled out of their context and dispersed. That's the essential difference. But I don't think that is a fundamental difference. And providing what you're looking for is integral to those individual cells, it really shouldn't matter whether they are in their context, in a stroma, or whether they're dispersed. And indeed, cytology specimens have been widely used for the last decade to look for single driver ge genomic abnormalities, EGF1 mutations, l cross one gene remains, with no trouble at all. And especially with a good aspirate, the failure rate because of inadequate numbers of cells or inadequate DNA is no greater than that for histology specimens. There has been a rather a reluctance to use cytology specimens for PDL1 expression, and this has arisen from the fact that cytology was not used in the clinical trials of the immune modulators that have now come to market, nor was it used by the diagnostics companies in developing their immunochemical assays. And that led to a, an understandable reluctance to um, promote cytology as a medium. However, if you look at the literature, you will see that there is no good evidence from any study, and there are now 10, maybe 15 over the last two years alone, to show that cytology is in any way inferior to histology as a medium for looking for PDL1 expression. There are worries about fixation. There is evidence now to show that whether you fix in alcohol or formalin really doesn't matter. And I think the only problem in, in, in reality is that they are tricky to interpret. You need a good pathologist with a lot of experience to assess PDL1 expression in a cytology specimen. Uh, but notwithstanding that, cytology is an excellent substrate for anything that you might want to do with it when you're profiling on small cell lung cancer. That's all for today. Thank you for watching Oncolive News Network. I'm Christy Rosa.